to Louis. Hello and welcome to the fourth call. Um, my name is uh, Luis Filippi, um, I will be the host facilitating the conversation today. And I work for the School of Data Science at the University of Virginia, where I teach for the Center for Data Ethics and Justice. And I'm also helping to create a laboratory for research and development of uh, free and open source technology. And I have two other colleagues here in the call uh, Daniel Mitchin and Lane Raspberry, who are also helping to build this laboratory at the School of Data Science. So um, first I would like to just um, tell you a bit about the context of these conversations, these calls that we have been organizing. Uh, so what is Open Climate? Clim open Climate is a collective uh, of people thinking and working to create bridges uh, between uh, communities in the open space, working with the commons, the digital commons, and uh, climate research. Uh, and uh, if you go to the notes, you will have a link for an article that this collective uh, wrote to explain what the open climate calls are. Um, so today, uh, for this particular call, we'll be talking about the promises and challenges of openness uh, with special guests. Uh, we uh, are going to be, uh, we'll hear from uh, Mayana Lassen, who is a social scientist uh, uh, who has a long tradition studying uh, sustainability. And she's an affiliate uh, with the Earth Systems Science Center of the Brazilian Institute for Space Research, uh, also known as INPI in Brazil. We also are going to hear from uh, Silvio Carlos, who is a senior software developer at the Social Environmental Institute in Brazil, uh, which is a very important institution in, in, in Brazil, like INPI, uh, for climate research, but also, and more importantly, for uh, supporting indigenous communities uh, in the struggle against de deforestation and illegal mining. And, and, and uh, uh, Silvio Carlos is going to talk about this. Uh, so I would like to get us started by posing a question to Mayana and, and Silvio. Uh, and it, it is a question that they will respond from their vantages, both from the, uh, from the perspective of the practice of science, of research on, on the climate crisis, but also from the perspective of a, a software developer, a technologist who is developing technologies to advance research of the climate. So our question for today is, uh, what are the challenges of openness Br here broadly construed and, 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 and um, analyzed from different angles? What are the challenges of openness in environmental research of the climate crisis? So I, I was just, uh, before we passed the, the, the uh, we opened the floor for Mayana to start uh, her presentation, I would like to just remind you that we have notes in the chat so you can follow them. And, uh, and, and in the chat, in the notes, you also have links for everything that I'm, I've been uh, talking ab about in terms of the organization of the open calls. So um, without further ado, I would like to uh, invite Mayana to start her presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, nice to participate here. Thanks for organizing and inviting me. Um, so I will share my screen here um, I just want you all to see my face first. It's always good to know who's talking. Um, and um, and get you onto my presentation here. So I I will start by so what are the challenges for openness? And this is something um, I'm a cultural anthropologist by training, and I have studied science as a social, social, cultural, and political process for several decades focused on climate change and sustainability. And um, so my argument here, what I want to highlight is that one of the challenges is that we have um, a very strong orientation towards sort of the anti-politics, which is to pre present and want the publics also to understand science as devoid of politics. And talking about it in any other way feels very threatening. And it feels threatening um, also to the environmental coalition because we really want people to believe in the science. And I wanna talk about some of the dilemma because it's very understandable that there, is, there are these concerns. You know, I myself have studied the anti-environmental movement 
Um, and so I know the dangers, you know, and, and what a formidable force that is. But I want to point also to how we do need to have openness about the mainstream science. Uh, because if we don't, we really risk, and this is what I've been seeing for decades now, is a limiting of the science agenda, is a very a limitation of what we even think of is, is relevant science when we think about climate change. And just to illustrate that, I'll start with this Google image. When you put in global environmental change, what kind of images do we get? This is what we get. So we get planets, we get, you know, we get parched environments, we get a few polar bears. There are some you know, humans here and there. I think you can see, can you see only my screen? But you know, there are some humans down there, you know, sort of, but it's usually the victims. It's not the people who are creating these problems. Um, and who are very much perpetuating them. So, so there's something very limited about how we even think about global environmental change and the research needed to, um, to understand it. So we keep thinking about climate change, making these predictions and we just get these predictions better of what the future climate change and the, you know, it will be, then somehow the action will happen. And that's just not quite what happens because we're not understanding that that this really is a problem which is social at its heart, that is about humans' politics. Um, and that creates a bit of a problem. So my argument here is one of the problems is how we think about what's relevant science. And then there are also some aspects beyond that, like um, that certain lines of research are marginalized and they're marginalized, they're not really included in these mainstream science organizations and something like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And within the social sciences, which already are marginalized, you have one strand, which is even more marginalized, which is sort of the sociology or anthropology of science, like the kind of research that I do. It's just not seen as relevant. It's not there. It's constantly left off the map. Um, because, and yet this is a discipline that can help create an openness to how science works. And I will, will you know, show more, you know, why I think that is so important. Now, if this is just to illustrate, this was a recent study by Overland Sovaco. They studied 37 countries, 333 funding sources for you know, 18, 19 years. And what they found out was that the climate uh, change focused social science funding was 700 times less than the funding that was available for natural science. And most of it is produced in the global north. So once you get to you know, the red arrow there is to over Latin American Caribbean. I mean, in the first columns there on the, in, the, in the table is from, it's an older one now, but it just illustrates what the reality is and which Overland Sovacol also captured, which is that we have very, very little social science focused on global environmental change outside of the global nor north. And even in the global north, we have little and is not so included in these mainstream um, arenas. And this matters, this is an, an article that came out this year that I, I, I wrote with Esther Turnout. And what we're arguing is that the, 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 the mainstream science also has interests. And this is these things. So the anti-politics fra you know, framework doesn't really permit talking about that. And the anti-environmentalism just reinforces that. So it's like, no, we have to cover this. We can't talk about that. And that what we argue in this article is that what we see is that this perpetuates a science agenda, which is not helping us get towards transformations. It keeps us in a very reformist sort of focusing precisely on the kind of science that I showed you. Um, and we're not talking much about the politics. We're not talking about this social heart, right? It doesn't come, and especially social hearts that are really like system critical. So things like political economy, looking critically at the mass media, thinking critically about you know how, how um, artificial intelligence also will factor into this. These things which are major challenges and hugely important are continually sidelined. And so we're saying we do need to look also at mainstream science, which is not to say it's a plot, but we have to understand the science itself, you know, is not this, you know, I, it must not be this idealized image because we need to be able to, uh, to calibrate what we get there and also ask some critical questions. It's too easy when you can kind of black out, you know, sort of when, you, when, when the science is left, in this bubble and we just say, this is the best science we have. This is the most you know, admirable scientist. And I don't, I don't disagree that they are like with the IPCC, but what matters is how many voices, what kind of perspectives and where does our intention go? Um, and do we really think further than just producing these continual predictions? Um, 
so this is an image from Brazil, which where we had this um, science without borders uh, under the, the 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 Workers Party. So it worked up until like 2016. But what was amazing was this was an investment explicitly to advance the knowledge society. And yet the areas that were eligible for funding in that were all natural and technical areas exclusively. There's not a single social science included. So this conceptualization of what is needed to get society ahead is so constantly limiting, bracketing, boxing away the social science. And this is not, you know, this is, um, you know, so there are all sorts of reasons, you know, we can unpack that, I can't go into all of them, but it's not, it is also because decision makers are uncomfortable with social science because it brings politics out uh, much more readily. So like I, I studied the large scale biosphere atmosphere program in Brazil, where the government actually wanted to have a kind of censorship control only over the social science and not over the natural science, which gives you an idea that this is not just something that happens por acaso, accidentally, right? Now, like I said, I had been studying climate science for decades now. And so I have, have I produced these articles you can see here, always trying to say, we need to look critically also at the climate modelers. Um, and I say, it's really dangerous actually, if we don't also do that because the idealized image of science that's produced actually creates a danger that when public see that it's not quite that, when something like climate gate, which is these controversies around that shows that science is also political and social in what scientists want to show to the public, then there can be a tendency to just throw out the whole baby with the bathwater, you know, because, wow, it must be a plot. We can't trust the scientists. I'm saying we need to have a public that understands what science is, including that it is a social political process, but that does not mean that it's not also the most rigorous, you know, process of knowledge production that we've been able to produce. So it's really important to have that kind of nuanced understanding. Um, and I'm by no means saying that science is all a plot and that it's all wrong. I'm just saying publics need to have a way to calibrate uh, what is presented as the truth. But this is really up against um, in a in a in a this context where you've had, especially in the U.S., this polarization, the climate wars um, have really become you know have absorbed this issue of climate change, and so you have something like the Republican war on science, right? So then any liberal will say, oh, we have to circle our wagons around the science and protect it. And my argument is that that leads to you know, these blind spots and they're really important. Um, so on the right here, I have you know, an, an example of the kind of science where even science, study, science and technology studies scholars will not look critically at the mainstream is, is uh, Naomi Oreskes and, 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 and Caraway's talk, which has been you know, uh, sort of this, the reference points for in, in, in many ways, but they just say, we look at the, at the contrarians, we won't look at the mainstream. And that's perpetuated in this report that's down below by the National Science Foundation in the US, where sociologists said, this is how sociology contribute to climate change. And there was not a single reference really sort of saying, we need to also have critical research on the scientific mainstream to understand how they produce, how they think, you know, and, and what is their relationship to power you know, and decision-making. Um, but you have someone like a science technology scholar, uh, scholar like Sheila Jasnov saying, now it's liberals who have lost sight of the social context of truth claims, meaning having a more critical perspective, right? And this is because of these culture wars. So we kind of tend to just follow this and go into these camps. And then, you know, everything is true that the climate scientists say and, you know, and, and, and vice versa, right? Um, and there has been, we can't, I won't talk about it now, I just want to flag that we've seen something very, very similar happening around the coronavirus, where it became a taboo and was really suppressed. Anyone was an extremist if they would talk about the lab leak origin theory of the coronavirus, which now is coming more out into the media. And so there's been this uh, misrecognition of the multiple possible origins of the coronavirus, which is hugely important for policy and for you know, science policy for, for, for preventing the pandemic um, in the future. So it has major consequences how, and this was also because there was this idealization of science, um, especially of Fauci in the United States and, and the polarization, especially around Trump. So this, perpetuates itself and runs over in other, in other areas as well. So one thing that I wanna say here is, is, and really bring through is that in that cultural culture war context, 
there is this assumption underpinning the liberal side that the optimal trust is full trust. But actually, if you look at the scholarship, it's that optimal trust is a mixture of trust and distrust. Um, so if you can see it here on the curve, insufficient trust is a problem, but so is excessive trust. And in the area of like science and science policy, it's that when you have excessive trust, then there is a capture, um, tends to develop between scientists and decision, and decision makers so that, um, so that they converge around what is proper and what should be funded. And so there's a support for specific streams of research at the exclusion of others. And as I've shown you, this is what has happened um, in climate. And just how extremely important that is, you know, when you can have something like in The Guardian, this title here on the top, our planet can't take in many more populists like Brazil's Bolsonaro, right? I mean, how profoundly important it is to understand how he got into power, which is all about si so, social politics, um, you know, geopolitics as well. Um, and, you know, and that brings us to like how the social media work, uh, the whole, you know, Facebook, uh, surveillance capitalism that Shoshana Zuboff, you know, has written about. And so uh, the coup we're not talking about, as she has said, is that we cannot have, um, is that there's been, there is this coup of how we even think and understand problems, right? And so, and yet that kind of inquiry is also just so off the map. And so on the right side here, I have um, some, some sayings. This was, for, um, I attended online um, a workshop on sustainability science that was held by the US National Academy of Sciences at the end of last year. And so at the end, there was this summing up after you'd had two days of these wonderful panels on, uh, of a lot of social science, very integrated science, uh, sustainability science. And then there were some commentators, you know, the, the designated commentators, we're saying, oh, we forgot to talk about media. Oh, we forgot about social. Forgot to talk about social media. Forgot to talk to talk about the political economy. Hmm. Right. And oh, we have to remember that social cultural systems are not something static. And so there is this danger that in the research that we that we think of, what we think of as relevant, what is funded, and even how we understand, is that somehow social change happens. It's kind of this black box that just happens that we somehow can't interfere in. But of course, we already are being interfered in through Facebooks, through these manipulations that have affected elections around the world. So, you know, but so my point here being that science is part of making this black boxing and that there is a certain defense around a certain lines of science. And we have to understand that we have a massive science uh, machinery, which is geared towards very natural science, right? I mean, so what do we do in that case when we have you know, because people want to keep doing their science. So we have to look at science budgets, have to see how can you possibly shift things without it being too threatening or, you know, so, so we have to understand science at that level as well as being an interest group. So I just want to say that, and I mean, this is my last slide with another article that was, that was uh, circulated here. And so it's that this really needs, this kind of focus on artificial intelligence really needs to be brought into the mainstream of how we even think about what is relevant to climate change, because this is how we change how people think, right? We, who is that we? That's one of the major research questions also, you know, or, or practical questions. But, you know, we actually have the tools to really change how people understand the problems of the world, but we're not really using it because we have this idea that it's all somehow neutral if we just leave the media machinery as they are right now, the political machinery as they are right now, as they are, then somehow it's neutral. But if we proactively thought about reshaping how people think, the values that are dominant, you know, by using these technologies, you know, and of course, everything, the devil is in the detail of who's to make these decisions and how, but I think that is where a lot of our decisions should be. Uh, you know, but we are being kept from that because there is this um, circling of the wagons around science that is science that's perpetuated, you know, and, and sanctioned under the IPCC, et cetera, and that we think of as being climate research. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mayana. This is a very powerful um, intervention and uh, an excellent uh, um, background uh, for, for the debate that, that will follow. So I would like to pass uh, to Sylvia now, and he's going to give um, a brief presentation, and then we'll start with questions uh, uh, for you, Mayana, and for Sylvia. So Sylvia, please, uh, it's uh, the floor is yours.
Well, um, hello everyone, and thanks uh, Luis Felipe, Shannon uh, for the invitation, and Mayana for the, the interesting presentation. I learned a lot reading your uh, two of your articles yesterday, preparing for this talk. Uh, also, thanks for Open Climate for this series of talks and for Apropedia for hosting them. Um, I, I'm going to present uh, some stuff for you. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it well. Uh, OK, first a disclaimer. I'm here uh, speaking as a researcher and not on behalf of my job, since I'm not entirely sure that my current uh, positions are shared by the institution where I work. Also, I'm, I'm going to read um, because I'm not a fluent English speaker and also because the current pandemic workload is making me very exhausted. So it's hard to think, it's hard to code, and even it's hard to think in English. So sorry, if, if I get too boring, please interrupt me, okay? Uh, and I'm entirely responsible for any mistakes in this talk. It's, it's perfectly understandable, okay. don't worry. <laughs> uh, now, now some background. Uh, I have a degree in meteorology, but since the early days in the university, I was very inclined into computers. So I ended up working as a computer programmer and a free software advocate. I also do some uh, technology and politics research, but uh, those are completely outside the academy. Uh, and the current increase in the threats to the environment in Brazil are making me every day into data science in the role of building systems and data visualizations. Uh, I'm, I'm working uh, in the Social Environmental Institute in Brazil, as uh, Luis Felipe said, which is also known as ISA, which is one of the biggest uh, NGOs in the country. Uh, ISA was funded in 1994, joining two words and building up a paradigm, which is very strong in Brazil nowadays, but elsewhere it's not uh, that used, which is the, the, the joining of the word social with environmental, which is not just about conservancy and environmental issues, but also the way society composes or also decomposes and is composed by the environment. So uh, ISA activities includes advocacy, field work and research, especially with indigenous uh, populations, like Luis said. Uh, ISA is specialized in protected areas, showing, uh, for example, how usually indigenous land suffered less from the threat of deforestation and in like, illegal mining since uh, those people are relatively successful in protecting their lands. Well, at least until now. Uh, I wanna show you some uh, projects. Uh, at ESA, we keep some uh, of them intended both to reduce uh, prejudice against traditional populations and to serve public available data on protected areas such as conservation, conservation units and indigenous lands. And just to cite some, we have a multilingual encyclopedia of uh, indigenous people, which we have, uh, you can, we can show you, there are more than a hundred indigenous peoples in Brazil. Uh, well, we can even bronze, bronze by a linguistic family. Uh, we have also uh, websites about uh, indigenous lands uh, with the current situation. Uh, we can even browse those uh, and have uh, detailed information of uh, each uh, indigenous land. Uh, we have the same for uh, conservation units, and we even have uh, free software projects like, like this web mapping tool, where we, we can show you right now uh, those polygons, you can see the, the protected areas and uh, those, uh, this, the shades are deforestation 
we can clearly show how uh, protected areas really protect uh, the land against uh, deforestation. So uh, currently we are very attentive to the alarming increases in deforestation, illegal mining and fires threatening not just the protected areas, but the whole, whole biomes like the Amazon and the Cerrado. So uh, we're focusing on issues linking to climate change, like uh, an eventual Amazon tipping point, which is, might, might happen around 25% of biome losses. Uh, we're also uh, aware of increasing violence and threats that traditional populations are facing, as well as their health conditions that might worsen in the coming years. Well, so that's that's too much for uh, the overview about what I do and uh, the current context. Uh, so let's go to the point. What are the challenges of, of translating the open movement work into environmental research of the climate crisis? So, well, I, I believe that the challenges are not just about translation, translating a framework such as those from the free software movement. Uh, into social environmental research, but also those that also uh, is faced, are faced by the free software movement. So I'll give you a, a, a short list in the hope that some of those problems catch your attention. And the first thing is something I will, I, I will call as a, a time frame dissonance, which uh, I will uh, summarize citing the Slow Science Manifesto that Isabelle Stengers wrote, and which I'd like to subscribe, but I didn't have time to read. I, I, I have too many urgencies to, emergencies to solve. So in, in the one hand, we have a strong need to have time to do a research in order to come up, come up with not only contemplative inquiries into theoretical solutions, but those that are also practical. But on the other hand, we have the urge of an act active science to solve things as fast as we can, because there might not be a, a tomorrow. And that leaves us with a patchwork of solutions that constantly need to be rebuilt. So uh, in part, this urgency comes from the threats to the environment coming from uh, this immense mega machine that is the current global civilization, if we can call it that way. But also the current regimes of research financing and, and, and budgeting are also a drive towards fast thinking, short sighted and short term projects, which uh, might even result in a, a streaming of non actionable studies and compendiums. So fast results are needed, but paradoxically, they might reproduce non-useful research, which is a huge, a huge weight of waste of uh, resources. resources sorry. So uh, decolonizing time might be the first priority. And uh, to paraphrase a famous quote, I'm uh, inclined to say that in the short run, we're already dead. But in the long run, uh, perhaps we have a chance. And that leads us to my second point as a consequence. It's the threat of obsolescence, which is both an environmental issue, issue by itself, but also uh, is a challenge to build sustainable technologies, including monitoring and other systems intended to last for decades. So uh, I see obsolescence as the other side of disruption. And disruptive thinking nowadays is encouraged, but not as the positive, transformative, deep changes needed for a more just and social environmentally respectful way of life, but instead as a way to deepen even more the threats that the current colonial mega machine is posing to the planet and to most people. So uh, not just research lines and outputs are threatened to be outdated by planet obsolescence, but also the technologies we use 
and even political and social systems. Well, even the planet. Uh, I will give you just a very small example. I just showed this, uh, this encyclopedia. Uh, that is a website that has more than 20 years. It's older than Wikipedia, perhaps and which needs constant maintenance and uh, had to be rebuilt to keep pace with the uh, current technology demands. And that's something that's very, very closely and, and drives us away for other important research. Now that we upgraded to use the same engine as Wikipedia, and I believe Apropedia as well, we're being haunted by the spectre of what is now it's wrongly branded as cloud native applications. So perhaps in the coming years, we need to migrate this platform ag again. So uh, this, this, this website and most websites we do is built using free software. But if free software at first was a solution against the planet obsolescence of the proprietary world, nowadays corporations in practice took control of important code bases driving the trend towards uh, their goals and harnessing the, the crowdsourcing effort of many while keeping core business algorithms as industrial secrets. So we're forced to follow upgrades and the pathway of those mainstream trends. Otherwise, we're doomed to keep all the code base ourselves, which means we're sailing between Scylla of disruption and Caribids of obsolescence. Which leads us to my third remark, and uh, sorry if it's taking too long, uh, which is the use to use existing technologies to create solutions for here and now, while we uh, also have the need to build uh, durable systems with non-colonialist mindsets which takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, sometimes projects fail not because they're essentially non-viable, but because the current context makes them not viable or the default trend is too intense to give a chance for the new. So per sometimes the less an idea fit in the worse. So there are plenty of ideas out there and blueprints in the graveyard of inventions. And we could enjoy some time exploring those, those places, those, those outskirts. Well, again, some, some projects needs time to mature. So it's important to alternate, in my opinion, uh, work between short-term projects and other projects with a 10 plus years time frame. But how it's possible to have projects so long if financing forces us to focus? And if you're really lucky, we can focus in five-year results, but usually way less, like two years, one year, or even half a year sometimes. So here we came to the fourth challenge, which is a challenge of, uh, I, see, I see as a challenge of union. Uh, usually only huge institutions can manage long-term projects by assembling multi multiple smaller projects that fits together in a whole. So why, why smaller organizations and even teams of researchers can't do the same? So at least in Brazil, there are many NGOs and institutions disputing financing and doing duplicate work hardly uh, sharing information and without a common agenda, which is a, a challenge I'm somehow involved in trying to solve by setting up a kind of a shared plan. But in part, those organizations are uniting because of the current context. In previous contexts, they were all doing their work and then just disputing the, 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 the financing. But even if small institutions are learning how to build an effective network, this articulation is still uh, oriented in the short term, which makes it difficult to invest in shared systems, tools, and data. So nobody seems to have time, energy, or other resources to, to build systems that takes time to build, 
But once the system systems are set, they save labor and, and leads us to another level of organizations. And here I see uh, software, I see code as encoded labor, which is not just some, not, software is not something you run. It's, it, it's, there's also labor uh, built on it and encoded on it. So uh, as an example, uh, many, many organizations here have trouble to guess what the, the government is actually doing since there are so, so much data spread that it's even difficult to know which, which government actions are part of an, an information war against society and which in fact are about, about de facto changes in, in policy. And that's my, my fifth point, uh, how to deal with issues of uh, public data access like, like what's currently going on in Brazil. So uh, some, some data here are vanishing by many methods like mass migrations in, in, in the many uh, government websites, uh, classification under secrecy provisions, lack of funding, uh, so public institutions cannot compile new data, uh, sometimes plain censorship and, and so on. <clears throat> so we have not only a challenge of processing and understating data, but also to safeguarding it by keeping copies. And as, as a last point, specifically uh, talking about creating tools for research and, and data visualization, I, I believe that those, those things nowadays aren't harder as creating meaningful narratives on top of those tools. So I see, uh, to summarize, I see the biggest challenge right now is to create narratives. And not just a narrative for a, a, a that, that, that data set visualization. I'm, I'm talking here about big and small narratives. And, and not only one narrative, but many narratives. And not just operational narratives on some data set, but I believe we, we need to have uh, existential narratives and something that uh, is not just objective science. It's uh, science li linking with social environmental causes. Uh, I just would like to check if I still have some time because now I would like to talk about some lessons learned learn from uh, the free software movement. Otherwise we can just and now and uh, start for questions. Um, Suvu, uh, I, would, I would like for us to get into the questions, but um, can, can we do a round of questions uh, for Mayan and for you? And then we talk a bit more and you can expand on the lessons as you respond to the questions. Because yes. we, have, we have about uh, 18 minutes. And um, so I want to make sure we, we ask um, uh, questions. We uh, everybody gets the chance to to to, answer, to ask questions to you and Mayana. So uh, thank you so much uh, for for providing us this presentation because you're actually getting at the bottom of for questions that are uh, questions that are foundational to the issues that we have been talking about in terms of the digital commons and its relation to climate research. So you're not focusing on the, more, uh, the questions of free software, for example, and the issues of free software, but you're talking about more fundamental questions of the mm -hmm. pressures of maintenance, of the questions of uh, planned obsolescence that sometimes free software is also part of, uh, questions of funding and dispute and the challenges of open data. So thank you very much for that. So uh, I would like to open the, uh, the floor now for questions. So if anyone has questions, uh, please just open a mic, ask away, and you can also post questions on the chat and we're going to read it out loud. I think we have Emilio up. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a question for each of the speakers. Well, first of all, thanks so much. Um, both of your presentations were really, uh, really, really nice. Uh, for Mayana, I, I, I'm curious about your views on the role of communication in science, because from what I can gather as a, you know, something that is needed uh, in, in the social realm, 
and the hard sciences, I think one important thing is how scientists communicate and they share ideas. So that's one. And then for Silvio about uh, maybe that can connect to the to to your uh, to what you wanted to speak about in the role of uh, open source uh, and free software about the perceive obsolescence. I'm curious about what are your thoughts on how to avoid uh, things being deemed as obsolete when they are not. So, thanks. Okay, I guess I will start. Um... For your questions, um, I, I heard two things. You know, so communication science is not, in my mind, the same as how scientists uh, communicate, but both are very relevant. And so I'll kind of answer two, have two different answers, I guess. Um, so how scientists communicate, I think, is um, how scientists in the climate world tend to think about communication. Is you know we just need to get the science more clearly communicated. There is this problem that the public doesn't understand. And then if we communicate it better, then they will understand. So, you know, now more recently there's been, there is more self-reflection of thinking, well, maybe we need to have the publics involved in, in thinking about helping us think about what is really important to them. But there is still this tendency to think of communication as something that comes afterwards. We'll produce our science. We have the answers. It's assumed that this is what the public needs. And rather than understanding the publics have their own logics and agendas and concerns and also wisdoms uh, that ideally should be pulled back so and, and revised what scientists even you know should be researching. So they're very different, those are two very different things, you know. So 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 improving this how scientists think about what communication is is a big uh, is one of the big challenges and I think sort of the holy grail and one of them. It's not the biggest one, but it's one of them. Um, also because, so communication is something more than just this, you know, we take the knowledge and we get it out, right? To understand that reality is constructed actually through communication. Um, and so that is such a radical, you know, and it seems sort of what we call constructivist uh, understanding of reality, but really truly, that's why the social media are so important, right? That how, shaping how people understand what the problems are, which is how we communicate you know, we already, that's already infused with norms, et cetera. So, so it's really important how that happens. And so that gets me to the sort of the second, you say communication science. I personally really like the work of someone like uh, Robert McChesney, who is someone who looks very much at the politi political economy of the mass communication systems. So that is where you actually understand that the media is also infused with interests. And so who gets that voice is already, you know, an expression of power. And so that there has to be sort of a deep rethinking of how the mass communication systems are, 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 are set up, you know, who pays for them, who controls them, who gets access is really important. And it's really important also to Silvio's point about we need more uh, new narratives. But it's very hard to see how we can get new narratives in there if, if there is such unequal access to these mass media to changing how people think. And that was my point with this, you know, talking about social media, talking about artificial intelligence, because a lot of decisions are being made by engineers, you know, software engineers at this point. And we just don't even have that on our map as something that we need to bring into the environmental arena as hugely relevant, really crucially important. So. Um, yeah, I'll finish there and let Silvio answer. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Emilio, for the, the, the question. And I really like it the way you, you put it, the term perceived obsolescence, which is, uh, well, it's, it's perceived, we perceive this, but at the same time, it's made as a reality since that we are uh, we are kind of victims of those this this obsolescence because we we cannot control uh, I, I cannot control the whole uh, free software uh, stack i run i depend on on the work of others so uh, that's uh, that's that's a very difficult question as 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 we said it's a background it's a, a deep question so what, what I can contribute is, is something I, I usually do, do at work. Uh, I, I'm one of uh, three uh, computer uh, software programmers in the, in, at uh, the institution I work at, at ESA. 
uh, it's a huge institution. It's uh, from for, for Brazilian standards. We have more than uh, 150 people uh, working there, but only three people coding actually. So uh, I have to do the work of many people uh, and I, I have to keep a lot of technologies. And one of the things we do is we, we, we don't make like hot sites, like campaign sites that last for one year or some months. We, we make stuff that lasts last for decades. So uh, to make this happen, uh, we, uh, the first, first like to summarize, we, we, we cannot believe the hype. Uh, so uh, new technologies arise uh, every day. So we are very, I think it's that, that slide from my own, I, I think uh, between uh, trust and mistrust. I think that's, that's what we apply for, uh, for to, to avoid obsolescence. Uh, we look at technology as uh, we, we need to be critical about what we're gonna adopt. And that's something we usually learn for, from indigenous populations because they don't adopt everything. They are very critical about what they uh, adopt. Uh, with I've, maybe the only exception is the smartphone technologies, which, in my opinion, is uh, it's degrading their, their future. But that's another uh, that's a point for another conversation. But usually they're very very critical, uh, and, and they adopt one only uh, stuff that uh, uh, works for them. So. Uh, another thing that we do is like we invest a lot on having backend systems and backend database with uh, solid technologies, uh, and the, the front end, the interface, those those things change change very fast. So we are uh, data, data visualizations change very fast. So we we have like a layer of a solid layer of data and and and, and databases and systems. Uh, that we do, uh, we are like very uh, mistrustful of uh, new things. And on the other hand, we have the, the, the front end layers that we perhaps sometimes we even we, 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 we contract people to do it. And we are assuming that every five years, at least we have to rebuild those, those interfaces, which is not uh, what I, I, I would like to have, but it's, it's a kind of a compromise. So we choose which systems, which are mission critical systems uh, that need to be very rock, rock solid and using uh, uh, well well grounded technologies. Uh, so I have I have some strategies to to handle the obsolescence, but uh, uh, I, I I don't know as, exactly uh, how, uh, how how we can solve this this thing because it's. It's a market force. It's a market trend. So uh, perhaps the the free software and free and open hardware movements can can come up with with a, a, a solution. And I, I I don't really know if it's a, a matter of forking uh, the whole stack and uh, we we keep up the whole stack if that's that's possible. It's so many li lines of code. So currently, it's very very difficult to do. Okay. So thank you. Um, we have on the stack uh, Petra. And uh, Ashley, so please, would you like to open your mic and, and ask the question? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, sorry for my noise. I have this computer that is about to kill. Um, thank you very much. It was super nice, this talk. I was really surprised to, to get this email and then very, surpri very nice surprise to hear all this talk. And I was wondering just if the uh, speakers have any, because I have, they haven't talked about it. And I don't know if it's something that, that they have come up with that um, this tension, you know, that seems to exist, at least in, in my experience between open data, open software movement, and the data sovereignty, well, not so, so much with open software, but especially with open science and open data, and then the data sovereignty, especially indigenous data sovereignty, you know, like um, how to solve this tension between making data as open as possible, as close as needed, no? And I, I have an, a really specific example because we developed a citizen science platform for people to contribute uh, local observations of climate change impacts. And then when we were trying to engage indigenous communities and in the process, um, well, a lot of them don't really want to share this information because it's information, for instance, about, I don't know, ice thickness, uh, like thinning, ice, ice thinning. 
Um, and then this could be an information that a petrol exploitation company can use, you know, to know where they can start uh, exploring for petrol or things about biodiversity or you name it. And there's also this thing about uh, eco surveillance, I think it's called or something like that, where, you know, with all these camera traps and all these open uh, data that is there that is being, um, it, that is good that it's open because then more people can can be critical about it. And as Mayana was saying, no, like there is this, this point on like uh, opening for controversies, but then at the same time, there is this privacy issue. So I don't know, just a reflection if, if, if the speakers want to comment on that. Thanks. Well, I, I, I think Silvio may have more to say about this because it's it's a little, it's a step further removed from what I'm, but um, I think there are um, issues of, you know, certainly always a concern. I think what is dangerous is when it's left too much of a closed door, who makes those decisions? Um, you know, uh, it, it's, you know, ideally you would have a system where there would also be more oversight than over those interests that will bulldoze her in and take advantage of it, right? I mean, that's my point that I would like to see more critical attention <laughs> focused on, you know, those aspects rather than, you know, but so sticking to, I mean, what you said just reminds me very much of, you know, sort of the, the, the it's, it's a dilemma of anthropologists always, right? That you, we go with the best of intentions out to the field and we, you know, render very visible these very marginal people. And we usually do it with such good intentions and we don't know how this, well, in histor historically, this knowledge has been used against the people. So it's a very long standing problem, you know, and how do you deal with that? Uh, you know, my point is to say, we need to render those making these decisions. So, so you know, include, Let's let's also study the corporations. Let's not let's not make only the vulnerable, you know, visible in that sense of understand how they work. You know, how do these societies work? How do these communities work? We also need to study up. You know, it's extremely important that and that's so that's very much ties in with my point about the needing to to study scientists, which is a kind of elite, right? And that has just not been done traditionally. It's being done more now. Um, but there is this sort of culture among anthropologists that we should always study the weak people, you know, but there is this tension that if we don't really, we really need to understand how the people in power work, because if we don't, they are invisible and that gives them much more discretion to continue working the, the way that they do. So I think in the end, you can turn it over to something about openness in the end, right? Um, but I mean, I think your question is very valid uh, and your, your point is very valid that, you know, we always try to be careful about um, about the knowledge. But there also think like one of my points in this article that just came out is that I think climate scientists almost benefit from this fear of how, you know, of knowledge because it's a way to put a blanket around, you know, put, put the science into a black box and then we get what they decide is important, which is what they know how to do. And you have that person who's looking for their keys underneath a lamppost because, you know, not where they, that's not where they left their keys, right? The keys, they lost them over there, but that's where there's light, right? And that's what, that's the problem with science. Um, if it's not flexible, if it's not adapting enough to what the real research question should be. And so we need to have that openness. So. I still think openness is important, but I hear you. I'll just turn it over to Silvio. Well, I, I, I agree that this is one of the most important questions when we are addressing openness in, in research uh, and very difficult one. I, I go uh, along with Mayana saying that uh, if there is a de decision the, the decision belongs to the traditional uh, populations involved in the research, and it's not uh, the researcher's uh, decision alone. So uh, I, I think, okay, that, that's easy for me. Okay, they decide, so uh, it's, it's not just that. I think we, we need to provide them uh, uh, some, some tools to help them to see how, how, how they uh, how, how their their knowledge might be used against them, or used to improve the 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 mega machine that's uh, being applied against them, and I, I think that this problem is even worse uh, with uh, traditional knowledge 
So one, one thing is that the thickness of the permafrost, one, the other thing I, I believe it's even more sensitive is the knowledge that they gather it for, from years and years of their own research. So uh, for instance, uh, colonization by the Europeans in Brazil only uh, happened uh, because of traditional uh, knowledge on, on, on how to live in the forest and how, how to live here. Otherwise, there, there would be no, no, no colonization the way we had. And if you look at how the indigenous people are today, you, you, you know, it's not a, a fair, uh, it, was, it wasn't fair. So uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's too hypocrite to, to come to those, uh, uh, to those people and say, oh, share everything like I'm sharing my software. And we, we know, you know, uh, they were being exploited for so many uh, centuries. So it's, uh, we can't just go there and, and, and ask for openness. So I think openness is important, but at, at, the, at the same time, we need to recognize that they, they, they don't have to open everything. They, they should keep some, some, uh, some knowledge away, even from us. They, they should protect themselves from us, from the resources, we, we've, even if we believe that we are on, on their side. So uh, I, I, I believe that we, there are many stuff we can do without uh, having to ask them for a lot of stuff. So I think we still can, can work around with open data and open environment data uh, for uh, uh, still a long time before having to uh, ask them to open some, some knowledge. And we can also negotiate. So it's hard, it's hard to know the, the results, what, what's going to happen with the, this, this so you knowledge. You making play noises. You. So uh, I think I think that's that's it's very complicated, but it's a very important question that needs needs more debate. And I'm, I'm not a, a specialist in this in this uh, in this point, by the way. Uh, well, um, uh, thank you um, very much um, for the questions, for being here with us today. We need to stop the call because people need to go to other um, other appointments. So please welcome me uh, in, in saying a big thank you to our speakers, Mayana and Silvio, for their brilliant and, and extremely important and urgent work. Uh, and for also sharing their, their perspectives on openness from very different angles and helping us uh, expand this notion and problematize the notion of openness in the work that we do. For positive, for bringing positive results in terms of climate research, but also for preventing us from making mistakes in the past in our debates about the digital commons, especially in terms of uh, the, the problems that we had in miscommunicating the question of openness when it comes to problems of uh, data sovereignty. So unfortunately, we will not be able to ask Ashley's question. So we'll get back to Ashley over email. And I just would like to just in one minute, uh, tell you about the next call that we're going to have uh, in, by the late August. So we're going to take a break in July and August in August 31st, we're going, to, we're going to resume our calls and we're going to have a call that will be hosted by Michelle Thorne, who's a colleague in the Open Climate Collaborative. And she is from Mozilla Foundation and she will uh, discuss the question of how the open internet can dismantle or not uh, the power structures that delay climate action. So please join us by the late August. And again, thank you very much, Mayana and Silvio. Uh, and thank you all for being here with us today. So look, looking forward to continue our conversation and exchange and the work that we have to do, the hard work that we all have to do together to advance climate research and activism. So thank you and have an excellent rest of the day. Thank you.